at the University of Oklahoma College of Law. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm actually at American University Washington College of Law, but um, thank you for having me. I, I want to uh, thank Mr. Bishop and the, and the chair and the panel for being extremely flexible and, and allowing uh, myself and others to reschedule to this time with the impending snow tomorrow. Um, I know I probably will be caught home with my sick kid tomorrow and so I wouldn't be able to be here pretty much no matter what's happening. So thank you for having me. Um, and as you can see, I, I literally walked in at the end of this hearing. Um, I'm slightly disadvantaged because I haven't heard the uh, the rest of the testimony before before us, and um, I, I could uh, I've reviewed some of the 301 submissions of some of the parties um, that have been here, and uh, I have I have some inclinations and and even fears about the way this process is potentially being connected to the special 301 process, um, and, and and I guess my point here is I is I think the commission should be very wary of making that connection. Um, the letter uh, from the senators uh, to you was very clear that they did not expect the commission to be making any legal findings. And I think that's gonna be very difficult for the commission to do. Um, there's difficulties that, that raise itself within the questionnaires itself. You ask about inappropriate intellectual property policies uh, or inadequate intellectual property policies, and it's it's hard to differentiate that without making legal conclusions on, on what those policies are. The special 301 process, um, things that you say could be brought into that process, and the process is fraught with legal problems. So there are two possible economic questions that, that come to play in the special 301 process. One is that in order for a country to be listed as a PFC, a priority foreign country, many of the submissions here are asking the USTR to do in a related proceeding, there has to be a finding by USTR that India's policies have the greatest adverse impact on relevant United States products. Many of the kinds of questions you asked, one, one could see parlaying itself into that process. But, but you can't make that link without making a legal determination that, that you're not empowered to make. And the second is that uh, many times the main threat that USTR uses in the Section 301 process against foreign countries is, is the reduction or, or denial of GSP benefits. But in order for the United States to lawfully have a criteria in relation to intellectual property to deny GSP benefits, that criteria itself needs to be addressed to a particular development, financial, and trade need of the developing countries. And there's a, a relatively recent case, the EC tariff case, that, that discusses that. The problem is these two standards find themselves um, in, a, in a legal catch-22. Um, in order to have that kind of a broad-based standard recognizing a particular developing need, the WTL appellate panel has found that that particular standard needs to find itself within a broad-based multilateral agreement. So the United States cannot decide for itself what intellectual property policies a country like India has that are, that are um, in conflict with its own development needs. The, obviously, the logical place to find those intellectual property policies is within TRIPS. But then you run into a parallel problem that there's been a, another panel ruling the WTO on the Section 301 saying that Section 301, it's parallel Special 301, <coughs> cannot be used to make unilateral findings of what violates TRIPS. Section 301 and the Parallel Special 301 can only be used to implement WTO dispute resolution findings itself. So that's the catch-22 that 301 finds itself in, is that in order to reduce GSP benefits, there has to be a violation of TRIPS, but the United States cannot unilaterally decide the violation of TRIPS. So you're going to need to skate on, on very thin ice and, and, and work through um, this report to try to avoid this report being used within the 301 process in a way that violates the United States' own legal commitments. <clears throat> now, going forward, let me just skip. I've, I've signed on um, uh, to the other uh, statement you have before you that talks about uh, some of the laws of India, why we think they, they comply with WTO law. I'm happy to answer questions on that, particularly on the compulsory licensing issue. But let me skip to, to some of the, the economic concerns. So I actually believe that, that many of the questions you ask would be very helpful for uh, the, the research community of which I'm a part. Um, 
I, I think that a clear-eyed analysis will actually show a relatively minimum impact of India's policies on uh, United States trade and United States economics. Um, and the reason for that is really um, something that, that Siri alluded to, which is that India is an extremely poor country with extremely high income inequality. And so the intellectual property policies that are being complained about have to be looked at within an overall economic structure. And it's one I've, I've written about uh, in a paper with uh, Aidan Hulls, Mike Palmetto, and myself about the incentives that intellectual property monopolies and monopolies in general give a firm in a highly unequal environment. And the incentive that gives where you have inequality that's so dramatic is to price to the very top tier of income earners within that country. And you see this uh, quite plainly in the next of our compulsory license. So the next of our, at the time of the next of our compulsory license, they are charging $5,000 a month in a country where the average income was less than $2,000 a year. We actually just this morning drew out a little chart. So the red line at the top is the price. Way over here is the average income of the top 20% of earners. So this is the gap between the income that people actually have and the price being demanded at the time. Now, that doesn't mean no one in India can afford that drug. It means that the real market for that drug are people in something like the top 1%, the top 0.5%, the top 0.1% of Indian income earners. Those people that would have enough resources to actually afford that drug are going to be minuscule. And those were exactly the criteria that the courts were looking at in the next of our compulsory licenses. They were looking at the minimal working of that drug as defined by, if you read the case itself, not whether it was manufactured in India, but whether people in India were able to consume that drug. And that is the historical definition of working going back hundreds of years. It's the definition that was at the heart of the Doha Declaration. It is the main example that people, including the US, uses as the legitimate grounds for a compulsory license. Now getting into the economics, so whether or not the compulsory license was legal, what is the substitution effect? How do you figure out the damages from the compulsory license, even if legal, on uh, United States businesses? Well, the question is, how many of these people would have bought the price at this price, would have bought the drug at this price? And the key here is you can't just take whatever the price is being demanded by the patent holding firm and multiply it by the number of generic sales. Because people that can afford a $100 drug can't necessarily afford a $5,000 drug. And that's just simple math. And I think the way intellectual property discussions have been going for the last 10 or 20 years, you often find those false substitutions take place within the kind of economic analysis that you see in this area. So I want to guard, guard you against, uh, or encourage you to guard yourself against that kind of simplistic analysis and really challenge you to look at what's the real effects? What's the real displacement effects for the purchases of Bayer's drug, the fact that there is a generic on the market, whether or not that generic is legally on the market? Um, I'm concerned about some, I'm concerned about the value of some of the questions that were asked uh, in the questionnaire, especially ones that, that ask um, companies to subjectively uh, analyze what the effect on their practices are. I don't see that there can be really any utility in that kind of question and for sure you need to dig deeper and get the substantiated facts. I think you have a bias problem in the selection uh, to the onset. So if your main way of getting information is asking people who are ticked off about India to submit to you what they think the effect on their practices are of various policies, you're going to get a certain kind of response. So to get a clear-eyed, fact, evidence-based response, I think you actually need to do affirmative work. You need to go out and get a unbiased sample and assess from that sample the kind of questions that I think are very legitimate. For instance, you know, which is more a barrier to your entering India, the physical infrastructure or your perception of its intellectual property policies? 
I think if you get the right sample, you're going to find some very interesting information coming from that. And that, you know, most likely some of the main barriers are more about India's infrastructure problems than they are about their intellectual property problems. Um, in, uh, I believe it's question uh, 13, part 5, you have a mention of local working that I don't think can give you uh, any valid results. So you pair local working with, um, uh, in, with uh, local content requirements. But local working itself, as I described to you in the next of our uh, uh, opinion, and case has multiple meanings. And the dominant definition of local working is failure to meet the local market on reasonable commercial terms and conditions. If you ask a group of, of intellectual property law professors if local working means local content requirements, I think your general answer would be no, not historically. In fact, I only know of a handful of countries around the world right now that continue to have local working requirements defined as local manufacturing requirements. And most of them have more general requirements, including India, talking about um, access on uh, reasonable terms and conditions. So I think that particular question needs to look at closely because without firmer analysis, people checking that box, it doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you what um, kind of definitions they're using to answer that question. I'm not sure how you can use the information um, uh, in the questionnaire about defining inadequate IP protection or inadequate protection of the test data, again, without making a legal determination about, about what that means or relying on the legal determination of others. There, I, I noticed that you have a room for um, companies to expand on what they mean, and of course, uh, that's going to be where your real information comes from and I would encourage you to have a process to be able to follow that up. Um, as I mentioned, I think the questions in, in 6.7 and 6.8 are interesting. And finally, I would just encourage you in, um, in analyzing the results of this and figuring out your way forward that you consult the economic development literature on um, the relation or lack thereof uh, between intellectual property policies and development. I was particularly noticed um, the contributions of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in the 301 hearing that cites um, a very skewed and very small representation of that literature. I'd be happy to give you um, citations to uh, a larger part of that literature, which in general um, points that the links between uh, the development of a developing country and intellectual property policies um, are pretty minimal and uh, very context specific and the kind of broad sweeping statements that more IP equals more development that you find in the Chamber of Commerce submissions I would say is not backed by um, the economic literature on this topic. And thank you very much for having me uh, and especially with your flexibility. Thank you. Thank you.